Hello, my name is David Curran, and what I'm going to talk about today is how you can build a chatbot. Why you want to build one, who you need to build one, what information you need to build one, and the concepts around it. A quick talk on all of those things together. This isn't going into the weeds with Excel spreadsheets and Python notebooks and stuff. This is the sort of thing that you know your boss can go through, can watch and say, right, this is what we need to do, this is how long it's going to take, let's decide if you want to do it. So I used to work as a technical lead for IBM Watson. I made chatbots there for loads of different uh, companies, mainly banks and insurance companies. These were in English, French, and Spanish. I'm currently working in Chinese on sort of aviation chatbots. And this is my LinkedIn. Uh, if you want to connect, please connect and uh, we can have a chat. So what I'm going to cover today is why is now a good time for chatbots, what they can do, some of the definitions around chatbots, because a lot of people use sort of hand wavy arguments. What they can't do, which I think is really important. I'm going to give you five steps you need to create a chatbot strategy and some checklists on who you need, how much time they need, when you need them, you know, what's the, the process that you can go to to build a chatbot. So for chatbots, people used to ring a call center, but now no one really likes using a phone. So obviously enough, people are using WhatsApp, WeChat, Facebook Messenger, these sorts of uh, ways to contact call centers. So what we're talking about today is a little window in the corner of an airline website or Facebook Messenger or Twitter or some sort of place you're putting in text messages uh, and getting answers back to solve your problems. Uh, voice chatbots, I'm not really going to touch on today. Almost everything I talk about will also apply to voice chatbots. But here, if you just think of the pure text, writing those words, that's what today's talk is about. So a chatbot is a computer program that conducts a conversation. Uh, they imitate human uh, conversation using artificial intelligence. They answer questions from a known data source. Not all of them do this, but for the ones we're talking about today, it's uh, we've written the answers for them in advance and they can go back and say, right, here's the, uh, here's the, here's the answer. Uh, you could have a dialogue and sometimes that dialogue will call APIs and get fresh information and stuff, but you know, that back and forward is really good when you do it well. i uh, will talk about it a bit today, uh, but there's also just straight, someone asks a question, they get an answer back. FAQ chatbots, as we call them. And as I said, today we'll be talking about text, but pretty much all this applies to voice. Voice is just uh, another sort of another way of getting in uh, language. So important provisos here. AI isn't magic. Machine learning isn't magic. Anyone who says this is magic and you can just give us the money and you'll have a chatbot tomorrow morning is trying to sell you something. Uh, it's you have to go through a process. People have to understand how your uh, your company, your business works. And a key part here is it, the system doesn't teach itself. Uh, just because someone has a conversation with it, it doesn't tend to get better. Uh, what you have to do is you have to go and look at that conversation and find if mistakes were made. Go use that to add and improve the data. Okay, so just after that warning of if someone says AI is magic, chatbots are magic, is going to work amazingly without you doing any work, they're not telling you the truth. So why would you want chatbots? Meet the customer where they are. Uh, they don't want to be waiting on a phone call for a call center. They just want to be sitting on the bus, typing away, getting the answers. So most important thing is a chatbot has to be a better experience. If you're just doing it to make things cheaper or to save money or to be cool or whatever, don't. Uh, unless the end users end up with a better experience, uh, I don't see the point of using them. So uh, here are the reasons why that can be a better experience. Sometimes one of the things that isn't mentioned here is you can say things to a chatbot you wouldn't say to a person, and you know you don't have embarrassment and such. So in some ways, you get a more honest view of the user. They can save time and money. Uh, so that's an important point here, that if you have a call center of 50 people and you can reduce the calls that people have to answer by 50%, you know, that's a good gain. If you are you know, spending 10 minutes at the end of the day in your florist shop answering a few questions, maybe chatbot isn't worth the effort there. So you probably want a, a place where there's a large number of people. Again, that helps you know, to get the data doing basic queries, usually to a consumer, so business to consumer. Business to business queries tend to be a lot more complicated and also less common. Uh, and one of the things here is a lot of call centers have a high churn rate of the people working there. And some of that's just because they keep getting asked the same boring questions over and over again. 
if you can reduce those really boring questions, uh, it can reduce churn, it can make the call centers the operators' lives better. Uh, so it's not as simple as a chatbot will replace X number of people. In my experience, that isn't what happens. Usually what happens is uh, the chatbot sort of augments the people. The people are doing the more clever or you know, harder tasks that you need people for, but the chatbot itself isn't necessarily getting rid of the people. Uh, and even sometimes you can just sort of triage questions. You can, you know, questions come in, they can be routed to the right person, the right information can be gathered, and that will save that person some time. Uh, so even in fairly complex domains, if a chatbot can help gather information and get the question to the right person, even that can be a big time saver. And the third thing, of course, with chatbots is you can earn more money. You know, they can, when you're booking a seat through a chatbot, uh, it can try and give you priority boarding. Uh, you know, these sort of service upsells and cross-sells can happen through a chatbot quite effectively. But usually what you concentrate on first is getting a good FAQ, the problems people have chatbot covered, a few of the most popular dialogues, the things people really want to do, you know, reset a password or something. It takes up a lot of your call center's time. And then after you get those sort of covered off, then maybe you worry about earning extra money. But those first two are sort of the priority. Okay. So how to create a chapter strategy in five steps. Everyone loves a good uh, ticking list off. So there are kind of five things you need to worry about in a chatbot. And they involve different skills and different talents. So a lot of the time they're different people. First one is personality effectively. What is the, the chatbot's vibe? What's it, what's it, how does it act? Yep. Then we go into sort of the technical issues. All of these sort of, all of these in fact, uh, I'll try and do a video on again, but today I'm just doing a quick push over so people who aren't used to chatbots and don't know the domain can see roughly what you know the lay of the land is. So intent, collect questions and see what people are asking about. So the intent is what is the person trying to do? Answers, when you know what they're trying to do, book a ticket, cancel a credit card, an answer that matches your brand that says, wait, well, here's how you go and cancel a credit card or you know, here's how you book a ticket or, you know, here's what meals are available. Entities, uh, sort of unique things about a question. So what meals are available in Dublin airport? Those sorts of, you know, unique things that might change the answer. And conversations, when you've gotten good intents, when you've got really good accuracy on those, you can start doing things like, instead of telling someone how to book a meal, you can go and walk them through the process of booking a meal. You can walk them through the process of buying a ticket. And doing that really speeds them up, really adds the value to the chatbot. Uh, but it kind of happens after you've gotten a really good understanding and, and the chatbot's gotten really good at knowing what the customer wants. And when you've gotten that, the next step then is to be able to go back and forward and collect the information from them to actually go and do the thing they want. Okay, so positioning personas and personality. I'm getting myself in the way here. This is kind of like a user experience job. It's kind of a fluffy, non-programming job, but it's vitally important. If you get this wrong and you get the tone or the personality or what the, the purpose of the job is, of the chatbot is, forget about everything else. It just isn't going to work. So this is everything from the user interface. Are we on WhatsApp? Are we on WeChat? Are we on Messenger? The tone. Uh, kind. Of, some of this is like who you represent. Is the chatbot pretending to, to be a sorry is is the chatbot acting like a customer service agent that's sort of that's their job description if you know what i mean or are they like a outside authority who's trying to help you pick between different electricity suppliers you know that's sort of more i'm on your side not the company side uh, so that sort of representation is quite important uh, in a chatbot personality you know i tend to think it's best to think of a person you know what age are they what are their hobbies where are they from and when you've got that personality defined for a chatbot, uh, it becomes an awful lot quicker, weirdly enough, to answer, to write the answers and um, this. So in, in many ways, this process here of defining the personality and stuff uh, really saves time later. One thing I'll say about this is, this isn't an area that an awful lot of people know, but if you start talking about this to someone in marketing, they get it immediately, much faster than like a programmer or, you know, uh, uh, you know, much faster than the program, but they kind of get brand personality, brand tone. Uh, they kind of get positioning in the sense of, you know, who, who is the chatbot uh, aimed at? These sorts of questions they can understand really quickly. 
So this is a place that if you have a marketing department or someone who understands that area, bring them in when you're deciding all this stuff. I'll give a talk again on all of this area, if that's interesting, but I'll, I'll move on to the next thing. So simple questions. I have a checklist. Next video, I'll, in the video on this, I'll go through this, but it's things like who are the target end users? What do they want to do? Uh, What's our relationship with them? Are they customers? Are they students? You know, what's the what's the relationship? Can we write a job description of the chatbot? Uh, when you go through these, you know, 10, 20 questions and you get good answers and you work out, it speeds up everything much later on. Uh, and it also stops you making a chatbot that just, you know, it, there's no need for it, which is, you know, just something you to avoid that if at all possible. You can make the most accurate, best AI ever, but if there's no purpose, then don't, you know. Okay. A lot of places, particularly banks and stuff, say, oh, we don't want a personality. We're just going to give you answers and there you are. But even banks have a brand. You know, the, the, the personality of a new internet bank is totally different to the personality to a sort of older bank. And you, with a chatbot, have a great opportunity to express your brand with every interaction you have. So it really is worth doing uh, personality. Uh, I tend to write down examples of how a chatbot would talk and stick them up on the wall around me. It just saves time later when you're writing the answers. You can think, oh, right, would that person say it like this? No, they'd say it like that. Uh, the tendency when you're writing answers is to flip into really formal tone really quickly. So you have to be very wary of that. You very quite quickly come quite robotic in how you write answers. So the main people worry that you'll be too informal and too flip, but the main risk I see in practice is you get too robotic in answers. Uh, so quick summary, you want a personality, everyone has a personality, people with no personality kind of have a personality, it's just a terrible personality. So do give your chatbot a personality, do work this stuff out. Okay, next thing, that was the first thing. Next thing is questions and intents, or utterances, so it's called. What are people asking to do? What do they actually mean? I want to check my airline points, I want to book in a bag, these sorts of questions. Uh, some of the earlier videos uh, in the series, this is actually the first video in it should be the first video, but we go into more details in the questions and intents already. Mm -hmm. So you can go there to understand some of the concepts and how you actually do this process. Roughly, what you want to think is the most popular questions cover an awful lot of, you know, the times people pick up the phone. So maybe 20% of the knowledge that a customer's care agent will have will cover 80% of the time they pick up the phone. And that's just the way these things work. If that doesn't happen in your domain, maybe it's not one that's suitable for a chatbot. So another way of thinking about this is you have a long tail. There's a million questions people can ask about, a million things people can ask. But if you're talking the top 50 to 200 most popular questions, what percentage of the time when you pick up the phone, you know, are you going to that particular answer in the FAQ? You know, one of the, you know, the top 50 FAQ answers. If it's a long, if it's a large number, that's you know it's a good candidate for a chatbot. Uh, you're probably talking 50 to 200 intents. This is like a domain with 10 to 20 topics, with a topic here being like a an important noun in your in your domain in in banking or in insurance or whatever. So uh, uh, the the account, the balance, uh, these sorts of things are your are your topics, and then the the verbs happen to these topics people check their account they close their account they do things to the the, the topic so uh, and if when you pick up the phone you have no idea what the customer is going to ask him you're probably not a deal for a chatbot if you could go work in that call center in a month's time have a reasonable confidence that you know so 80 90 percent of the time you're okay you'll be able to answer the customer's question that's probably something that's good for a chatbot so where do you get these questions? Uh, don't manufacture them. Uh, I've seen loads of cases where people get 10, you know, interns or students in a room and say, right, everyone asks me questions about bank accounts. And it just doesn't work. Uh, it's, you know, people can use, it, it's just terrible. Uh, don't do it that way. You need to get real questions, real customers are asking. Uh, now what you can do, particularly later in the process, is like user trials where you say, you get real people who will be customers and you say, well, imagine a situation where, uh, you're having a flight and the flight is delayed, what question would you ask? These these sorts of things. It's like a UX uh, task that also helps you gather uh, example questions. 
So somewhere here, get real questions. Don't computer generate questions. Don't get interns or MTurk to invent questions. It just does not work at all. There's an area uh, called Chit Chat uh, where, as well as just the strays, I can answer FAQ questions. You know, the questions that come in FAQ. It's also the hellos, the goodbyes, the I'm not sure, you know, for when you're low confidence, your answer, the I think the answer is these sorts of ums and ahs in, in a real conversation really give the person, the chatbot a personality and really affect how the user interacts with the chatbot. So they are something to worry about but you only worry about them once you've got the intentions and questions together, classified well, and then you move on to this next stage. Answers. I think always admit you're a chatbot. If you don't, uh, users tend to throw three or four problems at you at the same time, and chatbots are not good at that. They think they're talking to a person, they give you a paragraph explanation, whereas if you, can, if you know a chatbot, people are kind of better at going, right, well, here's problem one, let's deal with it, here's problem two. Uh, a bit like the problem of going formal, it's very easy to go back into expert speak. So, you know, people from airlines will talk like people from airlines with acronyms and stuff like this. Banks will do the same thing. It's it's a great advantage when the when you have the the questions real customers have actually asked you to use their own words back to them. Uh, so use that for that reason. It's just a thing to look for. As well as being overly formal, you can be overly technical. It's very common. A uh, huge mistake people make is a yes, no response. You know, the answer to can I get a car loan might be no, but you don't say no. You say, you know, no, I'm afraid, it's, I'm afraid you can't get a car loan at this time. Here's some other options, something like that. Uh, yes, no responses. Uh, they're bad customer experience and they come back and bite you in other ways as well. Uh, answers have to be really short. You're talking, you know, not a paragraph of text, particularly for a mobile phone. You know, you want to get short and snappy to the answer. Uh, that can have problems with insurance and legal where there's like a terms and conditions, but just bear in mind, keep your answers short. Uh, yeah. Okay, we're getting through the five now. Four entities. This is something uh, people talk about a lot where the specific information, like if you're booking a ticket, where are you booking it from? Where you're booking it uh, to, what day you're traveling, what class you're traveling in. The things that will change, you know, the price of the ticket are based on lots of this sort of unique information. And mm -hmm. uh, these here are entities. A lot of the time they just caught like a regex, or now it's getting a bit cleverer than that. But uh, a key thing here is don't worry about them until you've gotten the intents and questions and chit chat wise, then move on to entities. You can always tell when a program is made a chatbot because entities are just everywhere. It becomes this sort of brittle go-to jumps of, if they've used this word, this must be exactly what they mean. And that isn't what language works like. That isn't machine learning. That's uh, that's like one of the 1980s systems that just didn't really work. So entities, you do have to worry about them. They are really useful for calling APIs and stuff like that, You know, to actually go buy the ticket. Uh, but if you're, dialogue is using entities all over the place and they jump from here to there and everywhere it's a sign this it's the sign of something as well okay now when you've gotten all those things working then you can worry about conversation flow which is where a lot of the real value is in chatbots uh, so this is a series of steps back and forward you know to go order that pizza you know what is the topping what is the size back and forward you you know what's your address you gather all that information and then you can go do something uh, if you think of these as flow charts, it tends to be a good way to get your head around them. It's, you know, do we go A to B or B to C? Uh, you can do these with buttons. You know, do you want pepperoni pizza or Hawaiian pizza? Click, click, click. I don't think the experience is as good as if you could free text. Uh, they're an awful lot easier to do with buttons. Sometimes you have to use buttons if you think the user is getting confused or whatever. There's a, there's a whole, there's university departments that deal with conversational flow and dialogue. So just uh, my advice is don't worry about it until the previous four are working and then we'll cover it again in another video or two. Okay, summary. Five things you need to worry about. Personality and, you know, roles. Collecting questions and deciding how to label them. Writing answers that match your brand. Tends to be quite quick when you get used to it, uh, but it's not a skill everyone has by any means. Uh, entities, 
as in unique things about the domain that you need to capture uh, and conversations, conversation flows back and forth. All those five combined together would make a really good chatbot. Uh, but if you worry too much about one and not enough about the others, it just, everything will fall apart. Okay, so who is needed? I promised some checklists. So as I said before, People in marketing tend to be really good at finding tone, the personality and stuff like this. Uh, also part of you know building a chatbot is unless you can get the marketing department excited by this idea, you know, you, you've got issues anyway. So I I, I go there when uh, I'm trying to help define how the chatbot should sound. You of course need a business leader and a business validator, someone from the company you're working with, or someone in your own company who says, Why well, I can see why this will make uh, will improve customer experience I see where they save us money or whatever is the main task you're doing and they can sort of back you up with the people higher up and say well this is why we're building this let's go build this customer support you need someone who knows how to answer the questions you know someone who does this for a job and knows why when someone says uh, I want to cancel a seat what do you have to actually go and do and cancel a seat uh, you know they're, they're needed and they always will be needed and you're working with them not against them you know you're, you're trying to help them out here some sort of to call it cognitive engineer sometimes, but like a, a natural language processing programmer uh, who does the sort of tests and the metrics. I'm not really talking too much about metrics here, but like knows this whole process and can walk everyone through it, knows the next steps and can tie things together. You know, I won't know how to answer a, a customer's question in an insurance company. I can't do that. That's the customer support person, but I can, I, I know how to get the information from them and stuff like this. And of course, content writers, a lot of the time it comes down to the customer support people. Uh, they're really good at talking to customers and this is a similar job. Uh, but sometimes as well, it's, uh, you know, there's official content writers in an organization and they will help out as well. Time scales. Now, of course, like any plan, it won't survive contact with the enemy, but it's still better to have a plan. This is a rough guideline to how, how long these things tend to take. So define a personality. I say one to two weeks here. It's not really. It's a morning or day. But a lot of the time to get the white people in the room because it's the first thing you do, it takes you a week or two to organize. So in terms of physical solid work, it's probably, let's say, it's a day. But realize it's probably going to get, take about two weeks to get to that point where you can, you know, take that day. Gather questions from customer service. <laughs> This takes a while. Again, it's not you doing physical work. Sometimes it is if it's a call center and you have to you know, go through logs and write down the questions people are asking or whatever, but it tends to take about two weeks before they'll hand over sort of 500 questions that you can start classifying then. Maybe you're lucky it's a week. Occasionally, you know, they'll hand over 2,000 questions the first day, but just so you know, it can take a month before you're ready to work just to get all the data together and to get everyone to agree what the chatbot should be like and what it should do. Uh, they're not much work physically sitting at a table, but just to try and get the time in the organization, it takes takes that long, you know, calendar time. So classifying the questions with a bit of help from a customer service expert, you're talking probably about two weeks work. Uh, that's for a fairly simple chatbot now. Uh, getting the answers from the chatbot writers, Doing tests, finding problems, fixing things, getting new example questions to find hold, you know, for holes that you know don't have enough information. This sort of iterative process here. At the end of that, you know, you you'll move on to dialogues and things like this. But just to get a sort of a, a good FAQ answering chatbot out the box, out the door, it's kind of four man weeks, maybe a bit more of people's actual work and maybe almost a month to organize and get the data in advance before it. Uh, metrics, I won't go over today. There's a, a, a other talks already and coming up about, you know, how you tell you've got a good chatbot, how you do user testing, this sort of stuff. Uh, but this is just to say, this isn't kind of magic. We have AI, everything's solved. No, the solid metrics, what's our confidence? What's our accuracy? How is it improving? And these sorts of things are what lead you to get a good chatbot. It's not just, oh, we used IBM Watson, that's the end of it. It's, it's not a particular engine, whether it's Google or Microsoft or whatever, it's the process that gets you a really good chatbot. Each engine is fairly similar. You know, they have advantages and disadvantages, but without a good process, it doesn't matter what engine you're using. It's like, a, you know, 
the me driving a car versus a, the, an expert driving a car, even in the worst car, they're just going to be better than me. It's just you have to, you know, you have to go through the process. It's not just how big the engine is or whatever that affects things. Okay, thank you. Thank you for listening to me today. And that's all I have. If you want to get in contact, please do. And I will hopefully have a, some more videos for you soon.